Hello and welcome to Dielectric Videos. On today's video, I'm going to be building a 10S2P lithium ion battery pack. Now 10S2P means that there are 10 cells in series with two cells in parallel on each of those, uh, each of those sections of the battery, totaling up to 20 18650 cells. Now these particular cells are LG HG2s. They're 3000 milliamp hour, 20 volt dis or 20 amp discharge cells. They're designed for extremely high discharge rates so they should work very well for this application. And although they have been pre-soldered in a previous project, they are uh, effectively brand new in terms of, of cycle life, and as a result, they should perform excellently once I get the pack put together. Now to assemble this pack, I'm going to be using uh, this heat shrink, which is designed for two 18650 cells to go inside. This is just an isolator to separate each individual row of cells in the pack. And to join the pack cell or join the cells together, I'm going to be soldering using a uh, solder braid, which is effectively a, roughly the copper uh, copper cross-sectional area of 18 gauge conductor, and it has flux pre-built into it, which should make it easier to get it to solder to the cells. Now, before I get into any more specifics as to how I'm going to build this pack, or uh, in terms of what I'm going to do to actually lay it out, I want to mention a few key safety things. For one thing, 18650s can be very unstable if they're short-circuited or if they are overheated for a very long time or otherwise mechanically damaged, they can vent with flame, and that can be quite dramatic and can potentially even lead to a chain reaction wherein other cells in the pack also vent with flame. So I don't necessarily recommend trying this at home if you don't have prior experience. However, if you choose to do any sort of a project like this, you're doing so at your own risk, and I strongly recommend having some fire safety and fire suppression equipment on hand. Your first line of defense, at least from what I find useful, is to have a metal bucket filled with some sort of a, a stable material like sand. This is just something where you can toss a potentially hot or smoking part into that bucket uh, and basically contain it in the event that it starts to run away thermally. Now if you have a bigger fire or if it starts to get out of hand, it's a good idea to have a fire extinguisher on hand. This is an ABC dry chemical fire extinguisher. Anything similar to this with, uh, with, that's rated for electrical fire uh, extinguishing is going to be suitable as well. Now, like I said, if you choose to do any sort of uh, work with these batteries or with batteries like them, you're doing so at your own risk. I am not hugely experienced in building these battery packs, and as a result, I'm probably going to make mistakes and do things incorrectly in this video, since this is an experimental video. So if you see anything that you don't like or you think I should change or could improve on my next battery pack, go ahead and leave a comment below. I'll take that into account and I'll keep that in mind when I'm doing my next pack. So now that I've gotten all the safety disclaimers and the introduction out of the way, I'm going to get into showing you how I'm going to build each individual row of the battery pack and how I'm going to assemble them all together once it's complete. In order to construct this pack, I'm going to be using this overall circuit design here. I'm going to have each of the 10 uh, series connected two parallel cells stacked in series as you see, and between each two sets of cells, there's going to be a balancing lead going off to the BMS. Now what the BMS does, that's this device that I salvaged from another battery pack, is it checks through this uh, pinout header, it checks the voltage of each individual cell and it makes sure that all of those voltages are very, uh, very close to one another so that during charging and discharging, one cell doesn't get overcharged or over-discharged compared to all the others. Now when I implement this pack, I'm going to be assembling it in a similar fashion to this. From a side view, I'm going to have basically four uh, cells in each row, and each of these four cells is going to be doubled, uh, doubled in depth, so there's going to be effectively eight cells in each row. 8, 16, and then on the top there's going to be four more cells in the middle, totaling to 20 cells. Now to connect the cells together, as I mentioned, I'm going to be using desoldering braid, but I think it's important also to mention how it's done professionally in a mass production setting. Professionally, I have an example here of a uh, mass manufactured battery pack here. It's connected usually using nickel strips with a tack welder. It's effectively tack welded through the nickel onto the battery. And this is actually healthier for the battery because it reduces the amount of heat put into the cells during the manufacturing process. Now for most applications and mass production applications, this would be preferable, but since I'm building this pack in a small scale environment, 
I think soldering is going to be a viable alternative, particularly because the solder wick has built-in flux, so it should fairly easily adhere directly to the cells while minimizing the amount of dwell time I have to use on the soldering iron. So now I'm going to proceed to show you how to build one individual stack of four cells. That's going to be just the bottom four cells in one row. And that's going to be, each of those are going to be enclosed in a heat shrink tube of this PVC heat shrink. So I'll start setting that up. I will show you how I construct one of those packs and then I'll do the next four or the next three of those on my own, come back and show you how to build the rest of the pack. So as you can see here, I have pre-tinned the ends of these two sets of cells on both sides. And I've also pre-tinned the ends of this piece of desoldering braid. So now the next part is going to be attaching the desoldering braid to the cells and connecting it uh, in the middle to the other adjacent cells so that I can then fold this over like that and enclose it in heat shrink. Now before I start this, I want to mention something that's quite important about building these battery packs. If any anytime you're going to connect two cells in parallel, so these aren't going to be connected in parallel yet, but eventually when we do connect them in parallel, it's critical to make sure that the voltage on all cells is exactly the same. If you connect two cells in parallel with different voltages, the one with the higher voltage will try to charge up the one with the lower voltage and you can get enormous amounts of current flowing that can severely damage the cells and even result in a fire. Now I've already verified that the voltage is the same on all of these cells, so it should be safe to proceed. So what I'm going to do is I'll start out soldering it to this, uh, the anode of this cell. So I'm going to try to avoid uh, spending more than a few seconds of dwell time on here. I'm going to get it to melt like that, and once I release that, I'm just going to give it a tug to make sure it's not going anywhere, and that looks pretty secure. So now I'm just going to move down to the. I'm going to move down along the line, pre-tin the middle part once I have it lined up, like so, and using a pair of pliers to guide it, I'm going to lower the braid, melt the solder, and allow it to join up with the cell, like so. Now we have two cells joined, so now I'm going to proceed to do the same on these last two cells. Add a little more solder here, and I'm going to hold it down with the pliers, apply the heat. Now these are a little bit harder because the cathodes of these cells absorb a lot of heat, so I have to be quite careful about my dwell time and also have to apply a lot of heat very quickly to get it to bond. So that didn't look like a very strong bond, so I'm actually going to try that again. But first I'm going to do the end one to give it more stability. So let me proceed to melting the solder here. I'll flow in a little bit of extra to help bond the two together. And that's what it should look like. So let's see if we can do the same for this middle cell. Flow in some more, let it bond. There we go, that is a secure bond. So now we have these two cells, or these two sets of cells, ready to connect together. Let me just clean the tip of my iron since it's smoking a little bit there. And now we can fold them over like this. And we should now be able to secure that inside a piece of heat shrink. But before we do that, we have to make sure that we have a way to connect our BMS to this uh, central cell connection. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get some telephone wire and the color doesn't so much matter. I just want to have a few different colors to make it easier to keep track of which wire is which when I, uh, at the very end, I attach the BMS. I'm going to unwind the wire like this. I want to get maybe a foot to a foot and a half so that I can cut it shorter later. You always, it's always better to measure off too much with this sort of thing than to measure too little because it's very inconvenient to reopen the pack later on if you needed to do that. So that should be roughly enough wire. I'll trim it off there and strip the end. If I can get that stripped, yep, there we go. Now what I wanna do is I wanna secure this in such a way that it's not going to add any additional depth to this overall uh, battery configuration. So I'm gonna start the fold over like this and I'm going to wrap the wire around the braid at the middle point so that 
when it's pressed down and it sticks out like this, that's where it's, the solder joint is going to be. So now I'm going to flow in some solder at that point. And that should do it. And I'll make sure the cells can still sit flat against each other. Now it looks like I have compromised the ability for the cells to sit flat slightly. So I'm going to get the soldering iron and melt that a little bit more. Try and just conform it a little bit to the shape that I need. That should be good. And now the cells can sit very close, to, as close to one another as they possibly can without the balance lead adversely affecting that. So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to get my heat shrink out like this. And sometimes it's a little bit difficult to open. There you go. And I'm just going to feed the cells in like this, slide it over. And it's a pretty tight fit, so you want to really make sure it's in there well. I may have to trim up that connection there a little bit. want to make sure though that I don't take off too much active material and compromise the bond between the solder braids, but it looks like the bond is okay there. So now I'm going to continue feeding this in. I'm actually going to offset the wire so it runs down the middle. There we go. And I'm also going to put a second wrap of solder or, uh, heat shrink over the outside of this after I've shrunken this one on. So I'm going to line it up so that uh, I just have a little bit of heat shrink uh, off of each end because it will shrink on a little bit. And I'm going to inspect to make sure I'm not crushing any of the balance wire and I don't have any abrasions on the heat shrink. I'm also going to make sure that it's as dense and as uh, they're as close to, together as they possibly can be. And now I'm going to grab the heat gun. Now this is a 10 amp heat gun. It has a high and a low setting. I'm going to be using the lower setting so that I don't apply too much heat to the cells or melt the heat shrink down the middle. So I'm going to apply that heat and I'm going to evenly distribute it around. You see how this shrink wrap starts to, starts to shrink up when it gets warm. And I'll flip it over and do the same on this other side, being sure to evenly, oops, evenly distribute the heat. And looks like it's almost done. And I would say that's good. So we built our first 2S2P battery pack. We're going to be connecting four of these 2S2Ps in series and then an additional uh, four cells on the top of the pack. So in this uh, next part of the video, I'm going, to, uh, I'm going to have already built those next three and I'll be showing you how to assemble them together into the, the larger uh, overall pack. See you in a second. All right, so now I have all four of these 2S2P packs built, as well as a couple of small double packs for the top part of the battery. And I'm going to be positioning them as such. I wanna make sure that the little bumps of solder wick on the side are all facing outwards so that they're as minimally likely to short out on one another during vibration. So the packs are going to be oriented like this. I'm going to separate the lower two with this piece of heavy cardstock, and I'll use this smaller piece of heavy cardstock to separate the upper packs as well. So the first thing I'm going to do uh, to construct this setup is I'm going to connect the lower section together. Now what I'm effectively trying to assemble is a pack wherein my lower section is connected all the way together, and on the other side, these sections are connected vertically to one another like that. So what that's going to create is it's going to create a effectively, battery, effectively a battery pack where the current goes in through the positive here, through and around, down, back through, across, through this pack, up again and out here. And then on top of this, I'm going to place these two packs and these are going to be connected directly across so that my overall pack anode is here and my overall pack cathode is here. So I'm going to proceed to begin assembling these. I'm going to connect them together using some tape uh, temporarily to hold them in place. And uh, ultimately I'm going to put a lot more tape around the outside of it 
but this is just going to make sure that everything stays generally where it's supposed to be while the pack is under construction. So I'm going to line these up such that I can get my uh, solder wick material in between there and there. And I'm going to get some electrical tape and basically just strap this thing together. It doesn't have to be hugely strong initially since I'm going to be wrapping it up more thoroughly at a later time. But uh, it is a little bit of a trick to get everything lined up. I have to make certain that this entire side is flush because I don't want any uh, overlap or off, uh, offset on these things. So I'll apply the first loop of tape around here and I'll go around maybe two or three times just for good measure. Trim that. And I'll do the same over on this part. I'll line it up, make sure these are all flush and pretty spot on so there's no offset. The reason I don't want any offset is I need this pack to be as narrow as it possibly can be in order to fit into the hoverboard uh, chassis. So I don't want any of the cells sticking out farther than any of the other cells. That would create uh, potential for pressure points that would lead to short circuit and could also just make it not fit altogether. So I'm going to make sure it's as uh, compact as possible. And now it's pretty solidly attached together with this separator in between. I do see a little bit of offset there, so I'm just going to try and sort of just tack this down a little bit so that it's in place uh, and they're all pretty well uniform. All right, so I think the first thing I'm going to proceed to do here is I'm going to solder along the base to bond all of four of these batteries to, or all the four of these cells together. So I'll get the uh, balancing wires out of the way and I'm going to get started with that. So I'll get my solder uh, desoldering braid. It turns out actually there are heavier varieties of this desoldering braid. There's a, this is a number four and there's also a number six and possibly a number eight as well. So this is probably the minimum uh, size I'd be comfortable with using on a battery pack like this. In future packs, I may very well use an even heavier braid like a number six braid. But for this pack, I think it should be sufficient. We'll find out when we go out to test it later on. If, uh, if there's any short circuit on it or anything, that would indicate, of course, that the braid potentially melted. Now, I have tested this on the bench already, and it does withstand 30 amps uh, reasonably well. That's, it'll, it'll do 20 amps with no problem, and at 30 amps, it starts smoking a little bit. So I would say 20 amps is probably the safe limit of this particular soldering braid. So I'm going to start out uh, probably actually by pre-tinning this so that I don't have as much of a problem with uh, dwell time on the battery. So I'm going to pre-tin this a little bit. And I don't have to pre-tin all of it because I want to make sure that it's I line them up. I line up the spots of tin right where the batteries are. I want to be sure I don't over-tin the entire strip and lose flexibility. So I'm going to start on the anode of this cell and that should be good and now i guess um, i'll line this up and check to see that it is actually the right length trim off any excess like this and i'm going to start with also the cathode on this side and then i'll get the middle ones once the whole thing is strapped down so for this i'm going to just get it nice and hot and i'm going to flow in a little bit of solder trying to keep the dwell time not hugely high there we go. That's good. And now I'll solder in the middle cells. So I'll do the same thing where I feed in some solder and get it nice and flush like that. And I'll do the same thing over here. That one's having a little bit more trouble, but there we go. That ought to be good. So there it is. That's our first strap. I'm going to go ahead and proceed to solder through the two vertical sections over here, and I'll get back to you when I've completed that. So now I have connected the four cells at the bottom as I did in the previous part of this video, and I've also connected all of these end cells using two cross straps on each side, and then a, 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 a brace in between each two that I've tinned over for extra current handling capability. 
Now these cells look a little bit rough around the edges on these ends, but that's mostly to do with the fact that they were already used in a soldering application and already somewhat, uh, somewhat melted a little bit. But I verified that any spots that look dubious where a short circuit could occur, I covered up with an extra piece of electrical tape for extra precaution. Now in the final version, I'm going to have a, a piece of uh, hard plastic here, a thin piece of hard plastic, to protect this lower section from the metal bracing in the hoverboard chassis, and the same will be the case on this other side. So the next, uh, the next order of business is going to be connecting the lower bank, or the upper bank here, to the top bank of batteries here. And in order to do that, I'm actually going to be uh, connecting each one individually using a strap. I've uh, pre-soldered and pre-tinned a few straps. And then to make sure that the cells remain in balance, each of the two straps are going to be tied directly together and the balancing leads will be attached. Additionally, I need to attach the, a balancing lead here and balancing leads to here and here as well to make sure that I have all the necessary connections to go to the balancing connector, which uh, will plug into the BMS. So I'm going to proceed to uh, do a couple of connections between this uh, lower, or this upper bank on the bottom to this top bank. So I'm going to start out by getting the soldering iron and I'm going to pre-bend this a little bit. And now I'm just going to carefully approach the cell, get it hot, get it melted, release it, let it cool down, and I'm going to do the same thing on the lower cell. So you won't be able to see this because my hand is over it, but once I release the connection, you'll be able to see what that looks like. Now it looks like I might have used a little bit too much strap there. I uh, may have to narrow that out, but I should just be able to sort of push it aside. I think that'll be fine. Since I have two straps carrying the current, it's going to be beneficial to have, uh, I mean, it's not going to be like these straps are running at their absolute maximum uh, capacity. So I don't really have to worry that much about the length at this juncture here. So now I'm going to do the second one, like so. And once that is soldered, like so, I'm going to do the same thing and solder it to the lower cell. Oops, looks like I overshot that a little bit. Let me get the pliers so I can hold it a little bit more steadily. And that should be good. All right, now the next order of business is going to be uh, strapping these two together so that the two cells remain in balance as they are supposed to be in parallel. So. I will get uh, some solder out of here, or some solder wick out of here, and I'll connect those. So as you can see, I've completed the strap bonding here. I have not attached any of the balancing leads yet. That's going to be the next step in this project. But uh, you see, I connected each individual cell with its own braid across to the subsequent cell and bonded the two parallel packs or parallel strings together with a bonding strap here. Now this bonding strap ideally will not carry any significant current. It's just there to make sure the two uh, rows of cells remain in balance with one another. And I did the same on the other side. One of the things to note that was a little bit tricky about this maneuver though, was that uh, these two are diametrically opposed in terms of potential. Uh, the full voltage is not across here, but there would be roughly like 24 volts uh, with the full 40 amp current behind these. So I had to be very careful to make sure while I was soldering that the iron didn't accidentally contact between these two strips. Now, if you're concerned that this might uh, present a short circuit hazard in the future, I'm going to put uh, copious amounts of electrical tape over this section to make sure that even in the cases of extreme vibration, these have no ability to touch each other. So I'm gonna move on to wiring up the balancing leads. And since wiring the balancing leads is kind of an arduous and uh, maybe not the most exciting process for the viewers of this video, I'm gonna show you or tell you exactly what I'm going to do, and then I'm just gonna skip ahead to having already done it. So in order to get this uh, BMS to be able to monitor every single cell at the same time, I have to basically connect each individual cell that is corresponding to each of these red wires on this connector to, uh, to, its, to that connector uh, and to the cell via one of these uh, colored cables. So I'm gonna go through and connect this section, these two sections, 
this section and this section, as well as the bonding connections for the actual BMS output leads uh, as well with individual wires. I'll get back after I've done that, and then I'll show you how to connect those wires to this using heat shrink. So now all the balance leads are connected to the pack. You can see I have leads connected here, here. I have one here in the middle, and I have one connected on this side and one connected on this side going through. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to tape over the exposed copper, and I'm going to uh, begin connecting each balance lead to the respective connector on this, uh, on this breakout connection, which will then connect to the BMS. So I'm going to work on uh, taping this over. I'll start by heat shrinking a couple of these, and midway through this project or this process, I will stop and show you what I've done, and then I'll continue and finish the rest of it. So while I'm in the middle of this installation of the connections between the battery pack and the BMS uh, connector, I thought I'd show you quickly what the process for connecting one together is. So basically the way I've been doing this is I've been counting up each individual, uh, each individual row, and each of these rows corresponds to a separate bank of cells in here. If you actually look on the inside of this, I don't know if I'll be able to get it to zoom, but uh, if, let's see if it'll, if it'll zoom in. You can kind of see B1, B2, B3, etc. Uh, those are the individual batteries, so, or the individual cells in the 10S2P pack. So if you correspond that with the uh, respective holes on this connector, you can line up each one with the respective cell. Now I haven't chosen any particular color coding scheme for these individual wires, but I just have different colored wires to make it easier for me to trace which one goes inside the pack into which part of the battery. So for example, I've already uh, stripped back this cell, or this wire, I've joined it to this uh, connector, and I have a piece of heat shrink over the wire. So now I'm going to take the soldering iron and a bit of solder. I'm going to just carefully solder the two together, bearing in mind that you don't want to let any of these two, any two connectors touch at the same time because they're all at least one battery voltage away from one another. Once you have that solder joint made, slide the heat shrink over, get the heat gun out again, and hold it up away from the rest of the battery and allow the polyolefin to shrink up onto it. A high heat might be good here. And now it's uh, nicely shrunken in place and that'll provide a good insulating layer. So I'll do the rest of these next. All right, so I've completed connecting all of the balance leads to the individual cells of the battery. You see I've wired a little bit of a wiring harness loom type thing here where all of the connections are established through. And you'll see the only one I haven't connected yet is the one that's going to connect to the negative, which I still have to solder onto the batteries directly to the BMS. Another thing I took the liberty of including is a 25 amp uh, automotive fuse. This is going to be just general protection to make sure that if there's a prolonged overload on the battery or any other type of short circuit, it blows this fuse before any of these links overheat or before the batteries themselves take damage. So I'm going to be directly soldering the positive lead of the output cable to this fuse. Hopefully this fuse will never have to actually blow, so I don't anticipate needing to change it, but it's going to be present just as a last resort uh, to protect the rest of the battery against fire. So in this part of the video, I'm going to be installing the BMS. I'm going to be testing it, wrapping the whole thing up in tape, as well as putting on these guards on the lower sections of the battery. I was going to use plastic for the guards, but I decided that uh, due to the likelihood of it melting, heavy cardstock would be a better alternative for mechanical protection. And the last thing I'm going to do is install the label. This has all the information, let me get that to focus for you, all the information about the battery pack plus the dielectric video's symbol. And this is going to be able to effectively just dictate what kind of battery it is for anyone who may encounter it in the far future. So I'll continue on the work by installing the BMS. So the first thing I'm going to do to install the BMS is I'm going to connect the negative supply line to the negative sides of the battery so that I can then connect the negative uh, terminal to the BMS cable. So what I'm going to do there, I've already pre-tinned this wire. I'm going to get the red wire out of the way so it doesn't short against anything. 
And I'm going to get this wire melted before I actually start attaching it so I don't overdwell the batteries. So I'm gonna let this get warm and hopefully it's gonna mesh in. It may require a little bit of coercion with the bigger soldering iron if this doesn't work. I am dwelling a little bit too long, but let's get, maybe we can make this work. And that looks pretty good. It's looks like maybe I'll have to flow in a little more solder. I'm gonna let that cool for a bit because I did dwell quite a long time on there. And I don't wanna overheat that cell. So in the meantime, while that's uh, making its contact, I'm going to start on the other side here on this other battery. I'm gonna do the same thing, except this time I'm gonna flow in some extra solder to help with thermal transfer from the iron into the wire. And as you can see, yet again, the battery is acting like a giant heat sink and it's taking up a lot of my iron heat. So I'm going to hopefully get that. That actually is a pretty good bond as it is. I might consider using that, but I'll reinforce it a little bit now that I've given this other side enough, uh, chance, a chance to cool. So I'm gonna let this get warm again, let the solder melt through. Oh, there we go. And that is a much better connection there. And let's see if I can make the same thing happen over here. There it goes, now it's melting. Yeah, that's gonna be good. That's gonna be a good connection. And I can just verify that by tugging on that. No problems there. So the next thing I'm going to need to do is connect the balance lead. And uh, it is kind of interesting that they have a balance lead separate for the negative, considering the BMS already has a negative post. I'm not actually sure if those are directly connected on the PCB, but I'm going to assume they're not. So I am still going to hook it up. So here we go, connected there and flow in some solder. Hopefully this is still doing that. The copper is a good heat sink as it is. And it's almost there. That should be good. So now the balance lead's connected and I can pull the slack out of there. So now that the balance lead is connected, I can now proceed to install the BMS on the side of the unit. Before I do that, while I'm at it, I'm just gonna flow the positive lead onto this fuse. And that should be just a matter of melting the fuse uh, material and melting the wire, the solder on the wire, like so, and letting it cool on there. There we go. The positive lead's now connected to the fuse. Hopefully that won't melt if the fuse gets really hot. It's possible that it might, so I'm gonna have plenty of electrical tape to make sure there's no chance of a short circuit, but I'm going to assume that it's going to be fairly uh, stable in that condition. Now the next thing I'm going to do is uh, mount the BMS to the side of the pack. I'll tuck this wire safely out of the way and I'm going to just run a few layers of electrical tape around to hold the BMS in place. So I'll get that uh, ready here and you want to make sure it's square and you want to make sure that the bottom of the of the cardboard cover on it doesn't impinge on the lower section of the underside of the battery. You want the BMS to be as unobtrusive as possible. So we'll start wrapping like this. And this is going to be the final tape for the BMS, so I'm gonna go all the way around, but I don't want it to be too thick because I wanna make sure there's enough uh, thermal transfer on this heat sink if the MOSFETs inside get hot. This BMS is going to be withstanding the full discharge current of the pack, and that means the MOSFETs are going to need some cooling due to their non-zero RDS on, which is their drain to source resistance in the on state. Every MOSFET has an RDS on, there's no perfect MOSFET, and, but for most of them it's quite low, usually in the uh, milliohms, if not even less than the milliohms. So I'll trim the electrical tape there. That should be good on securing the BMS. And uh, I guess the last thing I'm gonna do before I put the end caps on, which are these cardboard protectors, is I'm going to make sure I put plenty of tape over the fuse to make sure that if someone tugs on the wires, it doesn't yank the fuse off of the board. So I wanna find a good uh, position for these wires to exit the pack. And this looks like a pretty safe place to put them. And I'm going to do the same thing where I wrap the tape around the fuse to make sure it stays put. 
because I have no idea if in the far future someone may find this pack and may uh, grab onto that cable and pull hard. So I'll go ahead and just wrap all these wires under. These are all 16 gauge wires, so they're not going to have any problems with heat. I don't need to worry too much about over wrapping them. So the tape is cut. And this is just general mechanical protection for these output cables. There's going to be an over, uh, overreaching wrap of electrical tape over the entire pack at the end as well. I don't want to add too much thickness, however, because it, st it does still need to fit in the board, in the hoverboard. So the next thing I want to do is uh, attach these mechanical guards to the lower plates, or the lower battery rows, and you'll see why that's a good idea when I actually st start putting this thing into the, uh, into the machine. So the first thing I'll do is I'll just attach this to the tape. Let me get that in shot so you guys can see it. I'm going to attach the one layer of tape over this piece of cardboard, like so. And I'm going to align it with where I need it to be to protect the cells. And I'm going to wrap a couple of layers. I don't want to put too much tape around here I'm going to do the same on the other side, but I don't want to put too much on because that would result in making the pack thicker and potentially making it not fit. If that happens, it's not a big deal because I can always just take the layers of tape off and wrap it a little bit less uh, robustly. So here we go. I'm going to put maybe three or four layers around to make sure that stays in place. That should be good. All right. So here we go, the tape is in place. That's gonna protect these end pieces against mechanical abrasion. And same on this side as well. So now the last thing to do, which is kind of the uh, kind of high stakes part that it's gonna test whether or not my work is quality, is I have to plug in the BMS. So if, uh, something, if the magic smoke comes out, we'll know I messed up. If the magic smoke doesn't come out, it'll most likely mean it is good. And I'm not seeing much magic smoke, so that's a good sign. Let me go grab my multimeter and we'll check to see if we're getting power at the output. Here it is. And zeroed out. Here we go. And we are getting 36 volts. Fantastic. These cells were charged to 3.6 volts each. So that is absolutely perfect. Now all I have to do is tuck all this uh, wiring harness away so that it's not going to get in the way of the pack when it's installed. It occurs to me I may have cut these a little bit too long. Let me move that better into the shot here. I may have cut these a little bit too long, so I gotta try and get them unobtrusively out of the way here. That ought to be reasonable. And a row of tape around that will assure that it is not going to get in the way of the wrapping. So, professionally speaking, if I were to build this pack, it would actually be better to use a large heat shrink that goes over the entire pack. But since this is such a limited quantity project, I'm only building one of these for the moment, I'm just using electrical tape as my wrapping. So we have power, the balance leads seem to be connected and working properly. The BMS is in place, the mechanical protection for the bottom cells is in place, and now it's probably a good time to wrap this whole thing up. Now this roll of electrical tape is pretty low, so I'm going to get a new roll, and I'm going to roll this whole thing up with a fresh, uh, fresh roll of electrical tape. We'll attach the label with some packing tape, and we'll see the moment of truth if it fits in the board. So I'll do that, and then I'll get back to you. And here it is, the world's first dielectric videos 10S2P lithium ion pack. It's all packaged up in electrical tape. All the uh, critical connections are covered to prevent uh, any risk of short circuit against the outside of the pack. And the leads going into the BMS are well established and uh, well covered. Got the label on there, tells me what all the parameters are for the discharge. 
Now the only thing that really matters is, will it fit in the machine? So this is the spot where it has to sit. We need to get it so that we can connect this to the receiving receptacle. And most critically, it has to fit between these two metal braces here and here. Now this is why I put those pieces of heavy cardstock in the lower sections of the pack because the pack needs to sit adjacent to that and it has to, I have to be sure that it won't uh, get damaged and short out against the metal chassis of the board. So let's find out what happens. Drum roll please. And it just fits perfectly. See that? It slides right in. It doesn't have too much play. In fact, it doesn't really have any play. And it sinks right down and there's no issue there getting it to connect. Now the second big drum roll please moment is when I plug it in, are we going to get juice out of it? Oops. And let's find out. That sounded good. It looks like we got power. In that case, uh, I'll hesitantly call this a good success. I have to take it out and do a lot of testing on it. I also have to charge it up since it's only at like 40% state of charge right now. and. Uh, I also need to make sure that my original bracket still fits comfortably over it. This is the bracket I made in a previous video to replace the broken one that was in there originally. And this bracket also relies on a piece of rubber protecting pad to make sure that the metal doesn't cut into the battery pack. So let's route the wires in such a way that they're out of the way. And let me see if I can get the pack or the uh, cover to fit over there. And it looks like it might be a little bit, uh, maybe a little bit thick because of all the tape layers, maybe more so than the original, but it looks like it's going to be close to fitting. So I'll get back to you when I get this secured. Well, after grinding a little bit of metal and crunching a little bit of thread material, we finally got this thing in. It's, uh, I may have to make a slightly a uh, slightly taller mount if I have any problems with stability of the of the pack because it's being compressed so much. But because of the way it's constructed, I not I, I doubt if that's going to be a really considerable problem in this case. Now I verified that this upper lid does still fit on the board, and uh, everything in here seems pretty secure. I can't get this thing to, to snap off, and this sheet of rubber under the metal is making sure that there isn't any excessive pressure between the mount and the battery, at least no, no pressure that's going to cut through the tape. There are still probably uh, at least maybe 10 or so pounds of downforce on this from this metal piece, but I think it'll survive it just because the uh, pack is built fairly solidly. There's not a whole lot of uh, metal on metal sort of close connections in this pack as it, as it is. So provided this thing doesn't shear off the threads, I think that would be the most likely failure mode. I think it should be perfectly adequate to hold this pack in place. So what I'm going to do next is I'm going to bolt this thing back together, I'm going to charge it all the way up to 42 volts, and then I'm going to take it out and ride it and see how far I can go before it's completely discharged to 2.9 volts per cell. So I'll get back to you when I finish that charging process. So now I have it pretty much fully charged, and I'm out on the board, you can see the voltage is 41.7 volts, so almost 42 volts. And I'm going to be taking this out for a ride with my GPS app, and I'm going to determine how far I can go on one charge. Now obviously it uses a little bit more power going faster than going slow, so I'm going to try to keep the speed at approximately just under the beeping speed, which is about 5 miles per hour. So I'm going to continue and ride, and uh, I'll get back to you once I determine if anything has gone wrong with the battery, or if uh, I've discharged it completely and I will be able to report on the distance traveled. See you in a minute. So I am right around 29, 28 and a half volts. And according to my GPS, I'm just about a tenth of a mile below 15 miles of range. Now this thing's getting really chewy and low, pretty uh, squishy on the acceleration. If I try to push it too hard, it just kind of drops out because there's so little power getting to the motors. But uh, the safe battery voltage minimum is 2.6 volts, so if I can keep it above 26, I might be able to get this to 15 miles of total range, if you can believe that. 
I'll post in the video a screenshot of my final outcome uh, from my range, uh, and it'll also have my speed information. Now I've been going considerably faster than the uh, what I was expecting. I was going to be going just just uh, quite a bit under the beep speed, but it turns. Oh, well, there's uh, there's the end of it. <laughs> there's the. It's pretty much uh, down and out. Looks like the BMS has cut it off, but uh, that's it. So yeah, the BMS shut down the uh, shut the board down for protection of the cells, which is good because that means it made sure that there was no uh, significant damage to the cells. I made 15.04 miles, and I didn't check my average speed. I will post it in the uh, annotation to the video, but uh, it looked like the average speed was around seven and a half miles per hour. So I'm going to go plug this thing in, make sure the BMS switches back on like it's supposed to. And uh, I would call this a tremendous success. The, I, I was thinking maybe I'd get like eight miles or so out of a charge, but a full charge getting me 15 miles was beyond my expectations. That's over a five-fold increase, actually close to a six-fold increase from the previous battery, and that's got to be at least a four-fold increase from when it was stock from the factory. So I am very satisfied with this performance, and uh, I would say this is a very successful project. So I'll get back on the bench, make sure everything's still working, and I'll report back then. So I've returned here to the, uh, to the house, and as you can see here, the BMS has basically shut it completely off. It won't allow it to restart if I press the button. Now, theoretically, if I plug in the charger, that should reinitialize the BMS and allow the machine to start up again. So let's make sure that works just to be sure there's no problems with the battery management. So we got that plugged in and I'm going to now unplug it and it should reset. And it looks like that's interesting. It's still is recognizing that it does not want to start. Looks like my battery voltage when I engage the boost converter is 30 volts. And it drops pretty fast. That's, I suppose, the BMS uh, keeping it in the off state. Maybe it's got a low high threshold that it has to follow. So I'll let that recharge for a bit and then we'll see what happens. After giving it just a few seconds more of charging, it appears as if the BMS has fully reset itself as you can see, if I activate the board, now it comes on and continues to operate. We've discharged it to about 2.97 volts per cell, which is roughly the minimum that you'd want to discharge to. And the pack is still operational. There's no problem with the BMS shutting off. So I would say that this is an extraordinary success. We've managed to make 15 miles out of a single charge on this new battery pack. As I mentioned, that's roughly a five-fold improvement from the uh, from my previous pack and uh, I would say as assembly of the pack goes it went reasonably well and I think the quality is uh, about what I would hope to expect from a pack. So as I mentioned before if you try anything in this video you're doing so at your own risk and if there's anything that you saw that you think I should improve in a future build of a battery pack or anything that you'd like to comment on feel free to leave a comment down below in the description. Thank you for watching this episode of Dielectric Videos, and I will see you next time.